Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens. SouthwoodGardenCenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's show, we are checking out some of the horticultural activities in Payne County, Oklahoma. Horticulture Extension Educator Keith Reed takes us on a bike ride to talk about connections between horticulture and bicycling. Keith looks at problems with trees in urban areas, Payne County Master Gardeners make seed bombs. We visit N40 Blackberry Farm, and Keith checks out how former host Steve Owens is keeping armadillos out of his display gardens. I'm Keith Reed, the horticulture educator for the Payne County Extension Office. This may seem like an unusual way for me to introduce myself for a gardening segment, but that's only if you don't know me. For those that do, you know that every chance I get, I love to ride my bike. Not only does it bring me a great deal of joy, but it's also crazy practical for making short trips around town like this right here. Before we get to that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our Payne County Extension Office. Each county extension office, while sharing a common mission, is a bit unique. We happen to have the home campus of Oklahoma State University right here in the center of our county, is the showpiece of our county, if you will. Not only is that a great source of pride for, for me as a horticulturalist, but it's also a great teaching tool for some of our horticultural programming efforts. One we're especially proud of is our fall garden tour. This year's tour is going to feature the campus as one of our showcase gardens. And our master gardeners would love nothing more than you to come to Stillwater on October 8th and join us for that tour. So here's an example I mentioned earlier. When I'm on the bicycle, I feel like I'm in the landscape as opposed to on it zooming by. And at that slower pace, that allows me to, to see and experience sights and sounds that I might normally miss. And here's, a, here's one quick example. We've got an old silver maple tree here, and I've had my eye on this tree for years. Uh, you take a glance here, it's obviously a common problem. Uh, Years ago, landscape fabric was, was placed here. Uh, it was forgotten about. The, uh, the tree is embedded the fabric and the, the edging right here. At this point, there's absolutely nothing I could do to come in and correct this tree, this issue. And at some point in this maple's life, this is going to compromise its life. And that's, you know, it is what it is, but uh, I, I think the lesson here is just uh, when you're doing things around the, the, the root system of a tree, uh, take extreme caution and, and remember to go back and, and look at that problem and, or look at that issue before it becomes a problem. I know in, when i dealing with clients in our office, I get a lot of, well, I won't live long enough to see a tree get big enough to see that. Well, turns out we do live long enough in most cases. And so this is something that could easily have been prevented, but now it's a significant problem or will be a significant problem for this tree at some point. As I mentioned earlier, I feel like in some ways riding my bike actually helps me to be a better horticulturalist. When I'm on the bike, I'm, I feel like I'm in the landscape. I'm a part of it, as opposed to just zooming by. And the la that allows me to see some things that I might normally, ordinarily miss. Uh, 
Here's a great example. We're on a heavily traveled street in Stillwater, just a couple blocks from my office. And uh, one of the things I've noticed through the years as I make this trip regularly is the advanced state of decline on a lot of our mature street trees. And that's no surprise. I know many of us, especially since the drought of 2011 and 12, have we continue to suffer losses from those, uh, those trees. And that is something we're gonna have to yet deal with for, for several more years. But sometimes in these situations, we're actually our own worst enemy, where we come in and uh, through redevelopment, uh, whether it's intentional or unintentional, perhaps a new septic line, a new sidewalk, we, we cause extensive damage to the root system of these old mature trees that will take decades to replace. Uh, if I could leave the viewers with one message, it would be to take, uh, uh, go to uh, extreme measures to protect the root system of your trees. I think uh, perhaps a visual example of that may be the best way to make my point. Uh, I think many of us uh, have gotten the idea somewhere along the line that if, if this wine glass represented a tree, my hand being the ground, uh, whatever is above the ground, if we turn that upside down, that's what the root system would look like. Uh, well, that's completely incorrect. Actually, a much better analogy and something for you to think about is that, once again, if this wine glass was the tree, but this dinner plate turned upside down was the root system of that tree, this is the critical area of that tree we need to protect. As you can see, if this is the drip line, those important feeder roots that provide water and air and nutrients to that tree are very close to the surface and they extend well beyond the drip line. So back to a situation like this where uh, we have trees that are overhanging the street, obviously if we do anything in the, in the yard or in the driveway close to those trees, it's gonna have an adverse effect. So sometimes uh, we, we go into situation like this just knowing and expecting that we are probably going to lose these old mature trees. But if they are important to you, uh, I would like for you to, to be aware of this fact so that you can take the best possible precautions against loss of these trees well before uh, you get into intimate construction details. Be proactive, talk to your contractor, talk to your, uh, your builder, say this tree is important to me let's get a professional in here and take a look and see what we need to do to give this tree the best chance of long-term success hi my name is Joan Thomas and I'm Nancy Etchison we're Payne County Master Gardeners and we're both retired teachers and we're the co-chairman of the Children's Education Committee for Payne County Master Gardeners. And we'd like to share with you today something that we've done a couple times with kids here in Payne County and we think it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's called seed bombs. Now, doesn't that sound like fun? Seed bombs, what are we gonna yeah. do with those? <laughs> well, kids like the, just the name of seed bombs. Just to start with, they get excited about that. And, but once they find out what they're going to do with them and what they're for and how they're going to make them, then they get really excited about it. So Native Americans packed mud around corn seeds to protect them from birds. And about 40 years ago, a uh, Japanese biologist came up with a way to plant his seeds, vegetable and grain seeds, in his fields without tilling or disturbing the residue for previous crops. That idea took off around the world, and we now have seed bombs. Um, we use clay to protect them. So you need a mixture of clay, and we are using um, kitty litter, which is a cheap way of having clay. You can also use artist clay. Uh, potter's clay. Yeah, the potter's clay is pretty expensive, so we choose not to use that. We would like to do the inexpensive way. You can also dig up the clay that Oklahoma is famous for um, at, out in your backyard, and you can use that clay. Clay is clay. 
but uh, that can have a lot of weed seeds in it, so we prefer not to do that. So this will make 10 or 12 golf ball sized seed bombs, which might be enough. So that's three, four, five of these of kitty litter. And then we've got, sometimes we use compost, sometimes we use a good potting soil. You really only need one scoop of that. And then we're gonna mix it up. And of course, this is gonna be messy. So no rings, apron, paper if you're doing this inside for sure. We're gonna mix this all up kind of neatly and then add water. You can use this scoop to sort of give you an idea. We've discovered though it takes more Quite than one. And, we're gonna mix and then up. we're gonna mix this up. Kids really like doing this because it's messy and fun. They um, dry nice and hard protects the seeds from baking in the sun. It's also hard enough that it keeps birds and other critters from nibbling at the seeds. And they're heavy enough that they don't blow away or wash away in the rain. So what we're gonna do today, this is enough to make, like I said, 10 or 12 seed bombs that are gonna be about golf ball size. And as the kitty litter gets wet, you can see it starts to dissolve a little bit. It gets yeah, it a little needs more. To get a little bit mushier. Yeah, we want the together. we want the texture of play-doh, essentially. So, oh, here it's starting to come. You have to work it just a little bit. You have to knead it just like you would potter's clay. It has to be worked. See now it's starting to want to stick together. You want to think about uh, what kind of seed you're putting into your bomb. Um, if you are putting seeds in, mixing seeds, you're going to want to make sure that they are compatible and that they are sown at the same time of year, that they have the same light requirement. Anything that will make you happy when you see those blooming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we found a great resource for Oklahoma natives, and that is uh, plants.usda.gov. So I've made a couple wildflower ones. And the wildflowers, I put quite a few more seeds in there because you can. And they don't mind being close together as much as like sunflowers do. So I've got a couple of these and now they have to dry. So when you're finished with these, they need to be set outside in a shady spot for about 24 to 48 hours, depending on the humidity. Like right now, probably 72 hours, it's been so <laughs> humid. But um, once they're dry and they will get about this dry, then you can do one of two things. You can either set them outside and wherever you want to plant them, or you can launch them somewhere. Um, that's the fun part for kids is even with a slingshot, they can launch them somewhere. Right. So as these, um, the, it has this hard crust, and as the crust, the seed germinates and the crust breaks, then the um, soil that's there helps the roots to grow. Well, and because they're round and the, the outside gets hard, it stays moist on the inside. And because it's clay, no matter which kind of clay you decide to use, it'll absorb moisture either from rainfall, uh, and sometimes you might want to plant these outside just before you know it's, gonna, it's going to have a good heavy rain. So making seed bombs is inexpensive, easy, fun. It's a messy. great project, messy. It's a great project to do with kids. So if you have these supplies on hand, someday when they're trapped in the house because of the weather, you can pull out these um, supplies and make seed bombs. They last for months. If you're gonna store them for a couple months, store them in a paper bag, not a plastic bag. And when you put them out, um, you have to decide if you want to water them depending on where you're putting them. If you're putting them in your garden, you're going to want to water them. But if you're just putting them out just somewhere, you don't plant them, them, you just throw, throw them. <laughs> Good morning. Today we're a few miles outside of Stillwater at what is quickly becoming one of our area's must-visit locations, North 40 Blackberries. And today we'd like to introduce the co-owner of North 40, Darla Black. 
morning, Keith. Good morning, Darla. So tell us a little, about, a little bit about your operation here. Well, we have four varieties of blackberries that ripen over the season from the beginning of June until mid-July. We had these plants tissue culture grown in Washington State so that when they arrived to us, they would be uh, free of any kind of plant pathogens. You've obviously done that. I mean, the plants look beautiful. The berries are beautiful. They're awesome. They taste wonderful. Uh, and, and the place is just a delight to walk around and, and tour and enjoy. So, okay, thank you for that. Now, I am curious a little bit, how in the world did, did you and your husband decide we're going to do our own U-Pick blackberry patch? Well, we visit a lot of u picks. We're fruit lovers. Okay. And so we decided that we wanted to put in some of our own blackberries so we wouldn't have to travel. And my husband said, well, let's put in about 50 plants. And I replied, you know, there's, it's a lot of work. Okay. We're, we're going to have to trellis. We're going to have to irrigate. If we're going to do 50, we may as well do 500. And we ended up ordering 800 okay. and so that's the beginning of N40 berries. Okay, all right. So have you always been a blackberry expert? Oh no, no. In fact, as a child, my mother would make me go outside and I would sit on the porch and cry because I wanted to come indoors. But as I grew older and participated in activities with my children, I began to understand and love the outdoors and nature. So about 10 years ago, my neighbor had this beautiful flower garden and I wanted to have nice flowers. Okay. Well, I saw an ad in the paper for the Master Gardener program with Payne County. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna sign up for this class and so I can grow flowers. Okay. And I did. Right. I became a master gardener. I have loved every minute of what I do. It was a good idea um, for the educational background to apply to whether it's my garden or my flowers or the blackberries. Right, right. So if I want to come visit your operation, how, how do I do that? Talk about the timing and how do we find out uh, more about you and sure. This whole thing. So. Blackberries are only available between the beginning of June and mid-July. The, the plants finish their cycle and then they're gone. That's all sure. there, there are. Um, we do have a website, which is just n40berries.com and a Facebook page as well. Okay. Um, our phone number is listed there. You can also give us a call and see what we're up to and what berries are available at that time. Okay. So Darla, I'd love to thank you for having us out today. Uh, I want to thank you again for all of your work as a, a Payne County Master Gardener. And to our viewers, I would just like to say that the next time you're in Stillwater during blackberry season, this is really a, a must visit destination. If you're a regular viewer of our show, our next guest needs no introduction, but just in case you happen to be new to Oklahoma Gardening, it is my great pleasure to introduce Steve Owens. Steve was not only a former host of Oklahoma Gardening, but he was a longtime employee of the, 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 the department actually that I worked for at one point in time, but now he is the owner of Bustani Plant Farm. So welcome to the show once again, Steve. Good to see you, Keith. So, uh, common problem we get in the extension office this time of year is, is large pests, uh, specifically pests that typically need a cage about this size. So as an expert, can you talk to us a little bit about your answer to some of these problems? Absolutely, yeah, and uh, you're referring to armadillos. I, I've been battling armadillos my entire horticulture career. All the gardens uh, where I've worked, we, we've had armadillo issues, okay. e even in town. Uh, 
Sure. Uh, but when, when I quit doing the program 10 years ago, we moved out here to start the nursery. Uh, we're out here, we got woods all around us, a lot of natural open areas. The armadillos come to our garden like an oasis in the desert. Which is what it is. Well, well thank you. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're watering and in the summertime when it's so dry, the ground is so hard. They smell that wet soil, they come in, and, and as you know, they're looking for the grubs and, and earthworms and all kinds of uh, insect larvae in the soil, and they do a lot of damage. They, uh, they're like little pigs. Sure. They, they just get that nose in the ground and they just, they, they, they knock plants out of the way, they make big holes, uh, they'll even dig a little bit, and just, uh, they, would, they were working the garden over every night. Okay. Well, one thing, I tried to do was was to trap them with the uh, the raccoon sized trap and that is somewhat effective but you you can't really trap them all uh right. you you it's catch just... one you relocate it and yeah they, away they, we go they they come right back sure so my first attempt uh other than trapping them was to put up a fence okay and we uh we took chicken wire here this is just regular chicken wire okay and uh, I buried it. I, I dug a little trench and I put it about a foot in the ground. Okay. And I remember when you did that. Yeah, yeah, when we first moved out here. Uh, but you can see, after, after about two years, uh, the chicken wire, it's, it's not coated or anything, and it rusted. I mean, it, it became very brittle. I was actually chasing an armadillo once and it went right through it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you can see it's 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 rusted and uh, it just it just broke loose right at the right. ground level. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, brittle. it's so brittle and uh, they can go right through it. So we got to thinking we we should try some other type of barrier, and okay. uh, I'll show you what we came up with. Great, let's go take a look. Steve, this looks pretty serious. Talk to us about what's going on here. Well, we've uh, upgraded our uh, style of fence. We've I'll say. We've got something a little more permanent and uh, different materials. Okay. We've got these uh, cedar uh, sort of rails here, and the uh, fence material is vinyl coated chain link. And that's important because it's buried uh, 12 inches underground here and the vinyl will keep the wire from rusting and okay. deteriorating and it's working great. It keeps the armadillos, keeps the skunks out and uh, it, we, we really love it. Okay. Now one of the things we're doing here with the, with the edging, I, I didn't want to keep weed eating along the side here because it's, it's a little bit hard to weed eat. Sure, uh, certainly. Yeah, right up against that wire. The grass kind of intertwines in the links. Um, and another thing, I didn't want to uh, use the weed eater often because you know it would tear the vinyl off uh, eventually right uh, so we're putting it in, putting in some edging on both sides putting down some fabric and adding some rock in here to make it decorative and where we don't have to weed eat so do you have an example of what that's going to look like when it's complete yeah we got one right over here wow steve this really looks great well thanks keith yeah this is the finished product here and uh, you can see we've got these uh, mexican beach pebbles in here i love this gray color and the uh, fence is back here. It's protected from the weed eater. Uh, it's easy just to bring the weed eater along the edging here and uh, uh, holds up great. Don't have to worry about tearing that vinyl off. And uh, we really, really uh, enjoy the, uh, the job this has done. It's, uh, it's kept the, the armadillos and the skunks from, from getting into the garden. Okay, well, congratulations. I know the, the local armadillo population is a little bit disappointed, but I, I think it looks fantastic. You know, uh, you and I have been friends a long time, so when you, frankly, when you started talking about this fence and you said, yeah, and I'm going to put chain link up, I was a little bit questioned that decision, sure, if, sure. if I could, because uh, uh, I thought visually it, it just would detract, but I must say, when we're in the garden ride here, uh, I love it. It, 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 it's, it changes the, the character of the space in a positive way. It, 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 uh, it frames it. I'm, I'm not even exactly sure how to, to say it, but it's a very positive feeling, and I just love the, the looks of things. So, thanks. Uh, great job. Well, thanks. We want to want to protect our plants here. Right. So, uh, can the public come out and, and do you mind showing showing them this this project? Well, our nursery is open in the spring and in the fall. We usually open mid-April uh, through the first weekend in June. Tuesdays through uh, Saturdays okay. and then in the fall we're also open a few weeks and this fall 2017 we're going to be open September 14th through October 7th Tuesdays through Saturdays if folks want to come out and uh, see it firsthand all right looking forward to it I know my plant list is ready so 
Thank you, Steve, and I guess we can find more information on your website. Absolutely. It's a pleasure showing you around, Keith. Good to see you again, and uh, yeah, if folks want to check out the website, they can uh, find out more information. Thank you. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we're off to Cleveland County, Oklahoma. Horticulture Extension Educator Tracy Miller takes us on a tour of a few of the highlights of the Cleveland County Master Gardener Demonstration and Teaching Garden. We also get the poop on vermiculture. And Tracy talks about research into using banker plants to help control greenhouse pests. We hope you join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Green Lake Nursery and the Garden Debut Plant, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. Hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.